Welcome to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. We are recording at USA Football's National Conference, and I'm excited to be joined by Matt Drinkle, who is now the tight ends coach at Army. Matt, great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Well, I'll tell you, like we just got to keep having you on this show because every time I talk to you, you've you've made another upward move. So I think the last time we talked, it was uh, prior to camp starting. You were uh, an offensive assistant or analyst. I, I can't remember your exact yep. title, but you are now an on-field coach. Yeah, it was a great move, and it's uh, a tight end at Army is as cool a position as there is to coach because they get to do everything. They line up at receiver some, they'll play tight end on the ball, they'll play tight end off the ball, they'll line up at tackle, so you get a really immersed in the whole part of the offense. So it's as far as a learning and involvement standpoint, it's as good of a situation to be in. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I know you've enjoyed your time there, you know, I've you and I are friends on Facebook, so I get to see, you know, all the stuff you've posted during the season. I, I enjoyed when you were the head coach at Kansas Wesleyan. I told you, you guys were the funnest staff in America, at least from the view, you know viewpoint <laughs> I was getting that perspective. But really cool just to see, you know, all, all the shots you took during the season, whether it was pregame or when you guys traveled somewhere, just you know, at, at West Point itself. Probably the coolest stuff was seeing the the inside of the army navy game right seeing yeah. you, you, taking some shots in in the locker room and with with president trump and you know in the stadium i mean just such a, a cool thing it was it was really uh, unique for me because i got to go in 18 as a fan and that was the first time i had ever had a chance to go and then to go back and be on the inside part the inside of it and get a see the inner workings of how it goes and the the importance it is and the sense of pride it is for both institutions and then all the pageantry that goes with it. I mean, you get a, that's by far the thing my wife and I like the most about West Point is just you, you have access to some of the most incredible leaders on the planet Earth right. and that that want to be associated with you just as bad as you do with them. So it was really neat to be able to meet so many different people. Yeah, like, it's no joke. Like, I, I tell people, I don't know if they've ever played, like, Grand Theft Auto, the video game, and you get a, you know, there's a part in it where you can get, like, all the police after you, and <laughs> it gets to the point where, like the military shows up and, and you don't have very much long to live. That's what it's like when the president shows up. It's caravans of people and dudes getting out that are heavily armed and ready to go. And then, yeah, but he, he came in before the game and, and took the time to shake every single person's hand on the whole team in the locker room. And him, General Williams, Coach Munkin had a chance to visit with everybody right before. And it's just it's a surreal moment to say that regardless of anyone's view on politics, but just he shook the hand of the sitting president of the United States of America. It's, a, it's one deal to see him. But it's another deal to be able to shake that guy's hand. And, you know, he's in the same service as, as the, our kids are, you know, serving the people of the United States of America. So it's something that you don't forget and that you don't take for granted. Yeah, well, definitely. And, you know, I was excited to get you out here to our national conference. And, you know, you want to make it clear what you were going to talk about here had nothing to do with the triple option. I mean, you know, in, it's before this year or last year, I should say, you weren't involved in that at all, so yeah, it has None. to be neat to be be learning a you know a different system and how that's done. I mean, it certainly has uh, proven effective for some programs across the country, and you know you'll see it at the high school level, et cetera. So you're learning that side of the game as well. Yeah, I'll tell you, and, I, and I, when I say I'm not involved with it, it's because I don't mean that in a negative way. It's that you think you know something, and you think you can like get a you know dip your toe in it. Man, the, the best thing that has happened to me from an offensive coaching standpoint is every time I walk into a meeting room, I'm the dumbest guy in the room by far now. And, that, and it's really, really helpful because I'm essentially being taught option football by the guys who are the forefront experts in it and guys that you know worked for Paul Johnson that are heavily influenced by him. And, you know, I don't know that it will ever change to where – high school programs, college programs, that's always going to remain a staple of offensive football because it is the great equalizer. It is with, the, you know, the play selection, the way you build culture, how many different ways you can do it, the different kinds of options there are. Just the, there's so many different components, uh, you know, being able to cancel out two defenders on a team and, and really kind of make – utilize the clock and all those things that can be a great equalizer when if you get to a place that wants to win that's what matters you know mm-hmm. at the end of the season you go I won the national championship or I won nine games they don't go oh, well, go talk me through game by game let me know what the score was if you can win a game 16 to 13 you know that's that's as good of a you know that's better than Wins losing 48 yeah. to 52 <laughs> 
So yeah. that, that, and, and the other part is when it gets going, it's 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 really difficult to defend just overall. And, and mm-hmm. you know, the other part too is you're starting to see some with rule changes defensively. You're starting to see some evolutionary patterns as far as uh, how people are even defending it or really unique ways where you're seeing something different. Not only are you seeing something different, you're seeing something different than what you even have seen on film or have even maybe prepared for. So all of those things are really unique and exciting challenges. And, and Coach Davis, our offense coordinator, he what I've really taken from him is, is regardless of the schematics of what you're going to run, X's and O's in the run game, we do some really, really creative things as far as unbalanced formations, condensed yeah. formations. You know, shifts, being able to be tempo out of, out of different personnel groupings, different formations and unbalanced, and it's it, th- that can be incorporated again into any offense. Yeah, well, it's, it's the principle. So, you know, what you're doing right now, what you're learning right now, you know, someday uh, you move on. You might not necessarily be, you know, a triple option guy, but you're going to have been influenced by the concept you've learned here and in, in the way, I mean, there's there's a method to all this madness. There's a way, reason they're doing certain things because of the way it affects the defense. And you know, when you learn that, even if you go away from it, those things stay with you, right? Yeah, absolutely. The other part that's just been, like, laughably fun is that everything that we do is 180 degrees different from the way I did stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I believe in the system I ran and how I got to that point. And, you know, I grew up as a pro-style guy and then kind of evolved into some spread principles but never could like let go of the anchor of the power of the pro styles right. but the way that we practice the way that we game plan the way that we view scouting reports or break down film or do installation work it is all so completely different and it's it's been like a revitalized shot of b12 in your arm that you just it's like a re-energizing thing because it's a whole new challenge and you're starting it and now don't get me wrong there's times where it's it's frustrating because it's so second nature to these guys, and it isn't to me. Not only, right. you know, that whole thing, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Like, the older I get, man, the worried I'm I'm a little worried about that that might be coming true. But it's just, it's fascinating to see how these guys can all operate within the system because it's like a living part of them. They've been doing it for so long, yeah. and it's been so ingrained. Well, and, and you know this, too. It drives defensive coordinators out of their mind because they got to face this you know one time a year and it, it, it was pretty neat when we first walked in yesterday into, into the vendor hall I right away had introduced you to Richie Gray and he saw the army logo and right away he shares a story with you you know he created a piece of equipment for Don Brown yeah to go against you guys yeah <laughs> called the hammer it's sitting right over there at the which the is Redemption. awesome it's a great pro like i'm telling you as soon as coach munkin sees that thing we're gonna have a couple of those at west point <laughs> but it, yeah it's just that's the other part too is just the military the piece of it you know my sister's husband used to teach at west point my brother's retired navy which i don't talk about very often <laughs> up at west point <laughs> but the united states army is the wor- is the biggest employer in the united states 1.4 million people involved so you can't go like your logo is so the brand is so recognizable wherever you go you get to hear incredibly personal relatable stories that's different than hey coach how are you how's it going you know that you run into so much coach talk in this right. profession you get to hear actual personal stories that are really really you know people feel very passionate about you know mm-hmm. what i mean it's not like hey i want to be air raid versus spread option and what's the difference and I mean, it's very genuine and very welcoming. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's it's funny. You and I now have been talking for, well, it was it was year one. You joined me on the podcast. This is going to year four, so almost four years now. And, you know, I had certainly gotten a peek. You had sent me your, your video clip and whatever. I was interested in, in what you were doing. And the other day, you and I were texting back and forth. And I said, hey, did I ever show you any of my stuff? <laughs> And, you know, I, I, I don't know if you were in a meeting or where you're at, but you know, I kept sending you these, and it's like, I love this. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> and then at one point, you know, we're going back and forth and getting fired up and talking offense, and, and I just sent you the, the, the gift file from Step Brothers where it said, <laughs> did we just become best friends? <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, I was, get, I, was, I was leaving work and then heading home, and I would get me in trouble with my wife because I can sit and I just sit and watch that stuff. I'm not a big multitasker, so... Once I saw what you're doing, it was uh, it is just crazy how much it was. It falls in line, and, and I'm obsessed with different components that people are doing to be successful and how you can incorporate those. But that's exactly it. You know, 
your stuff was so good, so clean, so versatile to end up doing. I mean, it was you and I were going to the same spot, but kind of getting there different ways. Yeah, and it right. was But very, very similar. Yeah. And it was just the subtle nuances. You start to appreciate that. It's like, like you know, like we were talking about me learning the option is is my understanding of the option. What I know now, which is half of one percent. I was like a TV commentator. You can't really tell at face value if you're not not an option guy the differences and the nuances in it but now that you can see the difference between like midline triple teams versus veer triple teams and outside veer triple teams and guys that are under center versus the gun and stuff that's dressed up to look like option when really in reality there's no option on it and how the option teams use those things to manipulate defenses into getting what they want it's all of those things, like the nuances of football like that, when you see people doing stuff at a high level, regardless of what – when I say high level, I mean high level of efficiency and productivity. Right. I think great great coaching happens everywhere. And I mm-hmm. think you're crazy if you just assume that if somebody coaches at a lower level or a higher level, that just means they're good or bad. So to me, I, I try to – you know, if the coaching world's a sponge, I try to wring out every drop of it I can get. Yeah, well, it was pretty neat. And, and I would say, like – my offensive background is pretty much the same. I think when I, once I settled into something that I started making my own, it was that pro-style stuff. I mean, it was just foreign for me to play constantly without a, a tight end. I could never live in 10 personnel. Like, yeah. You know, give me some fullbacks, too. I remember you sent out a tweet about that. Everybody should adopt a fullback. <laughs> yeah, man. Those guys are the best thing in football. I love those dudes. I mean, and it's neat to see some of that coming back into the game. You know, NFL – people used to joke just commentating about it, no fullbacks left right and now you see you know these guys coming back into it and that's the, the pendulum swinging back to more of that power personnel and I've just always been there with what I've liked about offense and I felt work well and was the same way though I'd consider myself pro style and then I implemented some spread things and I think you know we, we just used to when people say what do you run we said you know pro, pro style spread I don't know what it is, but that's we just invented it. But you know, that's, yeah. that's the name for what we do. It has those elements. We did a little RPO and this and that. But you know, it, it was neat as we sat down and just talked about things like the formation system, how how similar we had thought about things from just creating that. Yeah, that was awesome. I mean, yeah. we just sat and did that yesterday and talked about the the differences and how to move people around and and give different uh, show a bunch of different looks without changing personnel groupings necessarily and and then when you do change personnel groupings how to get different people in different spots and i think all of those things are underutilized by a lot of people because that puts so much stress defensively you know like i got my first crack in coaching you know under aaron wiley at bettendorf high school pretty much and it was my first job in coaching was on the defensive side of the ball my first paid job and if you change anything with formations or personnel groups, that guy's stressed out. You know, he's one yep. of the most successful coaches ever in Iowa high school football, and he's stressed out all the time about, uh, you know, so you see what gives those guys problems and how, you know, one of the things, I still, you know, I still think one of the things that benefited me the most is every year I sit down and I meet with several guys that are defensive coaches only because there's nothing you're really going to twist my arm to get me out of running inside zone or power, counter, counter tray, power read. So I don't really necessarily need to all the time go visit with, you know, it's ingrained in me, you know what right. I mean? Like maybe there's always going to be more ways of practice or whatever, but schematically I think the more you can talk to defensive guys to find out what they're doing to how they build their game plans and what gives them trouble and what breaks their rules, I think that that's just always been very, very beneficial. Yeah, and it's you, – you figure out what am I doing that really causes you concern – and what answers are you coming up for for that stuff? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. that's that's the stuff you want to see because you could, man, you can go down a rabbit hole with scheme all the time and go this way or that way. And you know, I think the best thing you do when you, you do sit down and look at what people are doing is try to find the common threads that validate what you're doing. And sometimes you tweak a thing here or there, but it's those. To me, I, I wanted an offensive system to be flexible enough to handle what we need to evolve over time for whatever reasons that might be maybe it's I have just a different skill set with the the personnel I have right now you know um, maybe it's you know things the opponent is doing on defense now that allow us to maybe focus on this part of it a little bit more you know the 
to me, the, the bad part is when you, you come back, you, you go out all season long, you're at clinics or you're sitting down with people and you come back and say, we got to change everything. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, I, I talk about it as evolution versus revolution. The revolution, you are starting from square one, not just as coaches, you've made everybody in your program a freshman because you got to go back to square one and learn everything, terminology, could be technique, everything. So it's, you know, I think when you set yourself up for success is, is when you think about structure and start with structure of your offense and ask yourself, as we were going through yesterday, like we were looking at the formation system, what if we wanted to do this? And there was so much of that when, when we started like revamping our offense. And, and it, it wasn't necessarily that we wanted to do that, but we were trying to think ahead that what if we had to evolve here, what would we do? If, as an example, we wanted to be a three-back offense, what would that set be? How would we do that? And so you, you start to fit those, those pieces in. But in going through that exercise, to me, it's, it's what starts to really make you multiple in understanding how wide of a range your, your offense has that you can take it where you need to go. I think a mistake a lot of people make or something that happens that gets people in a rut to where you can end up just kind of piling too much stuff on. You know what I mean? Like, if you think about it like this, if you have like a – if you have a 12-ounce glass and you've got a 2-liter bottle of pop, I don't care how much of that 2 liters you're going to put in there, you can only hold 12 ounces. So that's how I think of a, a, an offense should, should function. And I think that where everybody runs into a hiccup is when you have staff turnover on the offensive side and then those guys, you know, you bring in people from other places and then they all kind of get their heads together and, well, it's, I'm bringing – here's what we've been doing well then person a adds in what he's been doing person b adds in some of what he's been doing then another year comes by you know they you add that then person c comes in and adds some of what he's doing at some point you have to be able to say we do we don't need to hit the reset button but we need to restructure reorganize and make ourselves more efficient we need to streamline this so that hey here's this group of guys that we're doing and make sure that all the terminology fits you know I think that is such an important thing that you're not reusing terms or different categories like yeah yeah we talked about that I I just think that's so absolutely important so it's kids can learn a system as opposed to memorize plays or memorize formations because I think what that does is that helps with I think overall learning comprehension I helps it I think it helps with the speed of it and to me the most valuable part is it helps with position flexibility there's guy, you know, your next quarterback, if he's a really good athlete, should be able to be able to jump in a play receiver, or tailback, or something along those right. lines. I think that is so important. And people just, you get scared or you get ego and you and you don't do those things. And I just think that's so absolutely critical from a, from a learning standpoint for the players to whatever you can do to maximize their comprehension. Yeah. Do it. I think it's a, you look, and you don't always have, you know, that kid all the time who necessarily is your backup quarterback who's who's dynamic maybe you do but I I could think uh back to 2013 when I was at BW and you know our I think at the time he was our third quarterback man was he skilled like we couldn't justify leaving him as the third quarterback yet at the same time we know knew in the future he was going to be the quarterback so you, you know if you're caught in in a, in a system that doesn't allow that, like as you just spoke about here, and, and doesn't allow it to be easily learned, that kid just sits on the bench. So, I mean, and, and I could think of that particular year, game one, I think he took, I can't remember if it was a sweep or a bubble, but he took it like 60 yards for a touchdown in, in game one. And then guess what? We had some injuries throughout the season, and in week 10, he was our starting quarterback yeah. <laughs> and had a, a really great game there. But, you know, it's it's one of those things like, should he just be on the shelf till we need him? You know, yeah. and we thought, it would, you know, we didn't think it was going to be week 10. We didn't anticipate that, but we thought down the road that's going to be the guy. So you still want to train him as a QB, right? You don't want to say, I'll just go play receiver this year. We'll train you later. But when you structure your system, as you said, the right way, you're able to move guys around a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I have a kind of a – I'm not right, but in my own opinion, I have like a three-tiered progression to how you can get to play really well. And it just, it's its really easy. It's it, players, culture, execution. You have to have players that are good enough. You know, I think that that's the misconception is it, it's going to ebb and flow every year. It's going to be mm-hmm. some years you're, 
you don't have a super dynamic, ultra talented player at any position. There's going to be some years you're lucky enough to that you get a hold of that kid. But you got to have players that are good enough. Now, in college, you can recruit those guys. In high school, you can develop those guys. And you in college, you know, the higher up you go, the more development is. So you can get to that bar somehow or another. You got to have players that are good enough, not the best players. You know, I think too, I think that's a thing that coaches. It's too easy to rely on. You just go, oh, my players, we weren't very good this year. Well, this answers that. So you got to have players that are good enough. How you get that, maybe it's recruiting, maybe it's development, combination of both usually. But then the next piece is the culture. And the culture, I know that's a buzzword in coaching, but to me that's, that, to me, that's like the behavioral part of it. Do you want them to be really tough? Do you want them to be really smart? Do you want them to be really resilient? Do you want them to, you know, whatever it is, get them in the culture that's right for your system. Mike Leach is going to have a different culture system than Chris Kleiman is going to yeah. because of their systems that they run schematically. So to me, you get good enough players, you get them behaving in the culture to develop the culture that you want, and then it comes down to the execution part. And to me, it's you, you get these players that are going to be doing the, you know, that have the mindset that you want, and then how do you get them to execute? And I think that that is where a lot of coaches overcook it, is it, you know, when push comes to shove, Mike Uremovich, who's the OC at Temple, told me this when I was like 23 years old. He, he runs very few plays in the goal line, and he said, you know, what are you going to do, draw up something new? He goes, when it's really important, it really matters, what are you going to run? You're running your day one camp install plays because it's what you believe in. You're going to line up 22 personnel and run your inside zone or whatever it is, but you're going you're gonna to do what you believe in. So to me, it's get a good enough players, get those guys in the mindset that you want, and then Put them in a position where they can execute really well. I don't care what anyone says, whether it's fast guys, short guys, whatever it is, the team that executes better, but all the pieces, the ball security, the, the kicking game, the fundamentals, the tackling, the pursuit, the execution is what matters. So right. whether you're running inside zone or veer or power, it, that part of it doesn't really matter, in my opinion. It's, it's how can you execute at that point in time your plays that feed into your culture that you just reverse engineer it that meet that fits your culture with the players that you have and I think if you can always kind of walk yourself up and down that path and everything's aligned there that to me makes sense you don't want you know Mike Leach isn't going to sit there on the in the SEC title game next year and run two back power he's right. not going to do that to win it because that doesn't fit his cultures and it doesn't fit his players right. so I'm just using him as an example because everybody knows him and he's got a very unique you know niche in the system sure. So same thing. You're not probably not going to see Chris Kleiman in the Big 12 line up and zero personnel empty <laughs> and throw it 80 times in a game because yeah. that doesn't fit his culture and it doesn't fit his his, pers- his personnel and players. Yeah, it, it's an interesting dynamic because we've now at times leaned so heavy on the culture stuff that we forget about how those other things tie in. And I think, you know, to, to do it well, you, you can't live – and I had Andrew Coverdale on. He, he said, you know, culture and strategy don't need to be a dichotomy. And, and, you know, I think too often we simplify it as that. And say, oh, we're just, you know, we're all in on culture. Of course you are. You need to be. But, you know, part of that culture should be execution of a good system. Yeah, and absolutely. There's certain things you need out of, you know, I mean, culture is, is you know, beliefs and behaviors that create the outcome the experience right the results that you want well you know you look at a football play there are certain behaviors i need out of that play right you look at football in the context of the game i mean it is all you know we could think of you know brian and tim kite and e plus r equals oh i mean it's you got to operate within that system i think you know when you listen to you know urban talk about that year is that they just married culture and strategy together and, and taught in, in integrated E plus R equals O. I mean, that's exactly what you're talking about here, you know, with, with your personnel, your culture, your execution. Like, none of those things can e- exist without the other, they, and they can't be separate. Like, it has to be fully integrated. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's just, there's, the, you know, you brought up Coach Meyer in Ohio State. The year they won it with their, with Cardell Jones kid at quarterback. Yep. I mean, go watch the film. They did a great job of a kid who was really talented that probably wasn't as intellectually dialed in as Barrett, the starter. But when you go watch their film, 
they ended up in against Oregon in the national title, I believe it was. They, they went as many different ways possible to run flood mm-hmm. with nothing else on the backside. It was unbalanced. It was all three-by-ones or four-by-nones and just different ways, and, and they'd boot to it, drop back, sprint out to it. But it was one progression over and over and over and over again for that kid. And they did a great job of it. It wasn't reinventing the wheel or make this guy make miraculous things. They fit it to what he could do, what he could do fast, what he could do clean, what fit his skill set. It was a beautiful piece of coaching. And I think that's what people lose sight of is that, you know, if as good of a coach as Dabo Sweeney is at Clemson right now, if he was the head coach at Wyoming, I bet he doesn't do everything the exact same on offense. Right. I bet their scheme is going right. to change to match the personnel, to match the culture that he fits up there. So I always think that's those are the guys that are so brilliant to me as the ones that have the ability to adapt and be flexible to all of those outside variables that are that people just I think those guys continue to do a really good job with with, with their with their teams. Yeah. We've hit a lot on on your your philosophy here, you know, and all this kind of got packaged together in in your your talk with us here about structuring an offense, and you know, I had the opportunity to to get your your PowerPoint beforehand and see some of this, and you and I have talked about a lot of these things, but I think you know it's it's really valuable presentation here is is how you put it together, really to you know everything we've been talking up up about up to this point on the podcast gives some clarity in, in simple ways that you can set up your offense for success yeah so that, that's the goal of my talk when I talk about it is to be very inclusive I don't want someone to think that I'm like trying to sell the offense I run uh, or sell you know that it's, it's specified to anybody I I think there are some general overlying umbrella themes that can be applied to any offense at any level that you give you a really good assessment tool for your own situation no one knows more about your own situation than you do whether that's your own staff, your own personnel, your own league that you have to win, whatever it is. So, you know, I talk for an hour, and I have it broken into three sections, so 20 minutes apiece. One is on philosophy about some things I think, regardless of how you end up getting there, that you have to do to win on offense, that you have to do to score points and and put your team in a good position. The second piece is the design of offense and, and things to consideration. And then the last piece is the organization as far as once you get it down. So you're just kind of whittling it down into a V if you yeah. think about it like that. A, so philosophy, design, and then the organization as far as how to quantify what you're doing and why you're doing it, which I think if, if you can get to that point, you're in really good shape as opposed to just saying, you know, that well, that's how we've always done it or this is what we did a year ago or all of those things change. So that's really what the talk is about is – those three components philosophy design and then organization yeah and so it starts with the philosophy and you know you definitely have some clear-cut things here that that you need believe need to be a part of this as you're thinking about again your philosophy of what you're going to do yeah absolutely you know like you know when i was at kansas wesley and one of the things i always had to combat right away when you talk offensive football somebody and anyone who's not in the nfl or major fbs fights the same battle there's always at some point people are going to go you, you get fought with like, uh, well, the teams you're playing must not be that good or, uh, you know, that level of competition, whatever it is. But it's all a relative scale. That's why you're seeing a lot of these smaller level or smaller school guys go up and have success because it's all a relative scale. So I got asked a lot, like, what made us successful when we were at Kansas Wesleyan? Because we were pretty consistent, like, in the mid-40s points per game. The last year we were really good in the mid-50s. But – I really break it down into three things. We did three things really well. Number one was we had alignment program-wide, and alignment or the symbiotic relationship, whatever it is, however you want to term it. But everyone was on the same page, regardless of what was going to happen. We were very, very simple to our guys, complex yes. in appearance. Which, but the simplicity really, I thought, helped with overall comprehension, the comprehension of how it was coached, how it was executed, those things, and then – we fought really hard to be successful through attrition and this is the thing that you have to have which is ironic because in my own personal life I have no patience with anything that's a terrible character flaw of mine but you can just wait it out I'm telling you like a lot of success in you will find in life comes through attrition and in football specifically offensive football specifically is just wait it out man like the other team's gonna miss some blocks the other team's got a trick play that they 
some cool guy drew up three weeks ago that he's been working really hard to get in installed and maybe they're going to call it and take a 15 yards t- you know tackle for loss mm-hmm. you know back's going to reach the ball out for a first down on the other team and get the ball stripped out and fumbled or a bad call is going to go your way if you you know they're going to get a punt blocked or, or be aggressive on a blitz and give up a long touchdown something's going to happen to where as long as you don't screw it up and I know this always ends up as like sound bites for everybody but like as long as you don't lose the game you got a shot at winning the game. Mm-hmm. So a lot of, you know, we never, ever, ever talked about, and, and maybe to a fault, pro- truthfully probably to a fault, is we never talk about big plays or explosive plays or anything like that. All, our whole existence on the planet Earth was to avoid negative plays and avoid turnovers. Man, if we can do that and they get some negative plays and some turn the ball over some, we are in infinitely better shape than the other team is, and not just by taking twos and threes. And that's the that's the part of the the longer I study football, and I started this two seasons ago. The the longer I've studied football at at every level, the guys that win all the time, those coaches have done a good job of coaching the hidden yardage. Mm-hmm. They really focus on that, and I don't mean anything to do with special teams. Like the kick, special teams is not a kept secret anymore. There's right. a couple of guys that still think it is, or talk about it like it is. It isn't. Everyone gets how important it is. I'm talking about like when you go pull up. Like I challenge anyone listening to this, go pull up your clips of like inside zone or zone read from last year, and watch all your runs of four and zeros, like four, three, two, one, zero. Because no one does. Everybody sorts it longest gain to short. And then you sit there and you watch your 64-yarder and talk about that one for a long time. You watch your 52-yarder. You talk about Watch your 38s and your 18s. And, your, you know, you go. But nobody ever really – something comes up. Lunchtime happens. you got to go work out. Your wife calls. Kids got to go somewhere. And the ones that don't get watched are the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And the teams that are really good is like – I'll just use Saban for an example – but, like, Saban has mastered that if you run inside zone for 5.2 yards against everybody else on the season, you average three yards against him. And those two-yard gains, they don't seem like anything. You just say it two yards. It just means nothing when you say it. You know what I mean? Right. Two yards. Who cares? Two yards. There's 74 other plays in the game. It's two yards. But those two yards on every time they run the ball – that if he takes all those fives and they become threes and all those fours and they become twos, those change how you defend every single situation the rest of that drive. All of a sudden, second and sixes just became second and eights. Those get called completely different. Second and eights just became second and tens. And, and, and those change everything in the way a defense has to defend an offense. They, they, he forces you by just ch- you know chunking off those two little chunks of yards he forces you to become one-dimensional more often than what right. you want to be. And consequently, you know, take a, a year ago at Army, they are the best third and fourth down team in the history of college football. They figured out a way through the players, through the culture, through the execution. They, they lived in, in fourth and third and short and converted all those things, and that bleeds you to death. So mm-hmm. when you get back and you look at it, it's hard to figure out where, like, geez, we just lost. Like, where, what happened? You're probably not watching the – zone dive that went for two yards you know what i mean that's not drilled in the back of your head but i'm just convinced more than ever that those quote unquote forgettable plays or or hidden yardage plays teams that obsess with fixing those because the outliers are going to happen and that's what a long run is or a huge tackle for a loss no matter which side of the ball you coach the outliers will happen no matter what kid can you know throw a hitch guy can fall down and it can be a pick six or the db can fall down and it can go for six that will happen. It doesn't mean your hitch game is better than everybody else on the right. planet Earth. So I'm just, you know, I think the success through attrition. So really, like, the alignment for us was a huge contributor to our success. The simplicity and the comprehension of what we were doing and just the success through attrition that I cannot, if you can't tell by my 40-minute long answer, I cannot stress that enough. Yeah. And moving on and thinking about, again, your philosophy and things that can be applicable to every offense – you're going to spend time on you, right? We all go out, and, I mean, I, I like the use of analytics. I think they can tell you a lot about what's going to happen, but if you get focused so much on what another team's doing, you're neglecting to think about what you need to do. So you, you call it, you know, spend time 
looking in the mirror rather than sure. out the window. There's an awesome leadership paradigm that's basically like the window versus the mirror. And I think really good managers do this. Coach Munkin's as good at this as anybody on the planet Earth. He, Coach Munkin, I don't know if you got, if anyone has never met him, you need to, or spend time around him. He's as good of a head coach as there is as far from a leadership standpoint. I thought that before I worked here. Like, I obviously picked up my whole life and changed everything in my life because I believe in that guy. And then you get here and you see it, it's, it's even better than you'd hope. But really, the window versus the mirror is that when things are going really, really well, look out the window and see and give credit to what's contributing to making those things happen. It's probably your assistant coaches are doing a great job. The players are working hard. You have great internal leadership, your support staff, your athletic trainers. There's a lot of reasons to give praise when things are going bad or things are going good. When things are going bad, look in the mirror first. Figure out what can you be doing different before you point the finger at other Mm -hmm. people. And I believe so much of it that comes down to execution of your own system, your own plays, your own coaching points, your own comprehension, preparing your kids for the situation and the opponent, and being able to adapt to your own situation, especially personnel-driven. 95% of the time you have, you should spend on yourself. You're better off, you know, there's no rules that if you prepare for a 4-3 all week, they can come out in a 3-4. And now what? They, if you have worked your whole time on yourself, you're fine. Right. You know, that, that to me is the – so many people want to have an answer with a marker, and that's the most fickle, unreliable <laughs> thing that there is in football. So They all work, though, Matt. Yeah, man, especially if you have them last. You know, <laughs> That's the one thing. Like When I was doing this, uh, getting into it and starting to have some success and you know, offensively, like I'm a run the ball first guy, and I and I have a passing game. Like I have a very unique way of doing it, but it's essentially like if you ever played eighth grade football, those like three plays you installed to throw the ball, that's all we run, and we throw for like three thousand yards, somewhere between three thousand and thirty six hundred yards a year, like clockwork, and we run a eighth grade passing offense, and it used to just drive me nuts that I would like go. And, you know, you sit around and, like, at clinics, you sit with other coaches, and inevitably you get a couple young guys that just go ham on each other. And it's, well, we're, we protect like this, and we check everything at the line of scrimmage. Well, you can't do that because I do this, and he draws up what he'd do, and he'd blitz. Oh, well, then I just check the protection, and I'd throw hot over here. And they, you, I can only listen to it for a little bit. And I go, how many games did you win last year? <laughs> guy's like four. I'm like, how about you? And he's like, two. I'm like, your kids can't do any of this stuff. <laughs> stop ta- stop arguing about it. You know what I mean? Like, you guys are so worried about these. It's like ar- arguing about these who's better, Will Chamberlain or Shaq, that never played against each other and never can. You can't ever solve it. But just I just I believe wholeheartedly that, you know, f- philosophy-wise, there are a couple key things that everybody has to do to win on offense. Yeah. And I think you – the beauty of especially college football, and you're seeing it even more now in the NFL because there's kind of a, I don't want to use the term changing of the guard, yeah. but it was like the NFL for a while was riddled with all the Bill Walsh guys. You know, it was like all the Andy Reeds and John Gruden's and all those guys, you know, Mariucci and all those guys, and that, that coaching tree burst out and influenced the NFL real heavy. Mm-hmm. And now it's starting to happen with a whole new set of guys that are starting to do things a different way. And it's just, it's awesome when you, like, when you see the transition happening because right now the NFL's like cut into thirds, basically, of like where the philosophy is coming yeah. from. So, and college, it's it's even. That's why, like you know, I. Side note: I wish one of these pro teams that would start up would use college rules, yeah. use college rules and college hashes and numbers and the timing rules and what's a catch and what isn't, just because of the diversity. Mm-hmm. But if you, you go look and you look at how many different kinds of offense there are that can be successful, and it have been and proven to be. Right. You can have Mike Leach right next to Craig Bull, right next to Dan Mullen, right next to Chip Kelly, and it's all just completely different stuff. And then defensively, the same thing, 3-4, three, 4-3, yeah. four, four, three, pressure all the time, never pressure, some zone, some man, whatever. There's tons of ways to be successful. So, uh, But on offense specifically, I think that we all – drive different looking cars but end up at the exact same destination yeah, true i believe that and then those things are you know i at some point in time you're gonna have to run the ball and you're gonna have to run the ball effectively and what, what i mean by that is you don't have to average x amount of yards doesn't equal x amount of wins but yet at some point you have to run the ball effectively in the situations that it calls for avoid negative plays like the plague it's like taking a zero on a 
on a grade in school. It just cripples mm-hmm. you. If you make people defend the entire field, whether that's through formation or scheme, I think that's critical. Offensive football is in the business of expanding space. Defensive football is in the business of condensing it. So whether you want to do that by blocking a guy or running a pass route or using a formation, whatever it is, got to create as much space as you can. Yep. you got to be physical. That's got to be built in. I mean, you can throw it every down if you want, but your pass pro has got to be physical. Your releases at the line of scrimmage, all those things. You got to avoid turnovers. Obviously, I got that's. I know that sounds just so cliche, but just if you don't do it and they do, your chances of going up. Right. All the analytics that people are using now it shows you. But then, and the last part is have fun. You know, I, you hear a lot of coaches right now talking about the transfer rule. I'm like, all right, well, make sure your kids are having a good time too. You know what I mean? I don't think that that's a. I always think about that whenever I'm coaching or wherever I'm talking to, talking to my old staff about how to coach football is like man think we all played did you like it when you were getting screamed at and (laughs) and called every four-letter word in the book and not told not explain things thoroughly like that was my big thing is I wanted things explained to me so I knew what I was doing like if you're the push route on a flood concept don't just go oh you got to run off here and then the kid just goes well I'm never getting the ball here and then can jog the route because he doesn't has no comprehension that he's opening up for the sale route or whatever underneath underneath but you know, I think that's a big thing is, like, coach your kids the way you wanted to be coached, the way that you get a chance to be the creative coach, you know, the, the 99s on everything mm-hmm. for every kid that plays for you. And I think that's a – people lose sight of that. You know, I, as you and I have walked through and, you know, we bumped into some different college coaches here, the conversation a couple times has gone to simplicity, you know, and uh, – you made the point. You know, teams doing it really well. Yeah, man, like, You're going to see. I'm just sitting here. Play. I feel like I've been on this soapbox for a couple years about do less. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, do less, keep it simple, do less, keep it simple. I'm to the point now where, like, I want someone to at least argue with me. <laughs> you know, who out there is doing it real simple that sucks? Right. You know what I mean? You listen to all these people that are ultra successful at everywhere they go. And every level they coach at. And they're really, really simple. And uh, you watch these people that have every play that's ever been created in the history of football all dumped into their whiteboard and then their install plans and all that. And it's just you see that over and over and over again not be the answer a lot of the times. Yeah. And I think, too, especially if some of, the, if some of these transfer rules do happen, you're going to have to have guys that can walk in the door and play. You know what I mean? Like getting good enough players, like I was talking about, that, that's hard to do. That's hard. You know, no matter what you have to do at any level, acquiring good players is hard to do, especially if you want to win titles, conference titles or national titles or advance in the playoffs. It's hard. So when you do have it, you want to be able to make sure that the best ones that you have are playing. It's like you said with your the yeah, backup quarterback. Right. Like, who are your best 11 players? What do those kids do well? And just oh, we always go back to that over and over again. But, yeah, just the simplicity piece and, and the, the – I guess term I use for all the time is the simplicity paradox. Figure out like a teeter-totter. How can I be really simple to my guys but appear very complex to the teams that we're playing? Or or not even appear complex, but be hard to defend. How can I be simple to us for us to execute but complex to defend? And and you got to fight that battle, and you got to have people on your staff or that have your ear that are willing to tell you when you're doing too much or doing something that's stupid or, hey, we are too simple. You know, one of the things that just blows my mind is I go watch some of these, like, crazy big FBS teams that have staffs of 900 people that go in their gun, and their gun every play, and their offset gun, and they don't do anything with the back to not get dialed up on defensively. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't switch them side to side. They don't use pistol. They'll just put the back there, and he's static, and he's camped out there, and they just – like they forget that that's a piece of it. Well, the other guy sat and had a plan. Hey, when the back is here, right? Where the run? If it's one back, the run's typically going away. And there are a couple defensive guys that if you do that to them, you'll have 110 yards by the end of the day, no matter what scheme you're running. So, making sure that you appear very difficult to defend, or you are difficult to defend, is really important. But just I can't the simplicity piece. I want someone to at least come tell me that you need to be running everything under the sun. Yeah, and that's I want to hear that counter argument. 
Yeah, right. It, I mean, you, you look at you know the Super Bowl and the Niners making it there. You know their style of, of, of football, but if you watched them throughout the year, and there was all kinds of window dressing to it, but they still had a lot of those same concepts that you would see again and again. Yeah. And I mean, I forget the statistic, but incredibly high compared to everybody else, how much they moved people around. And that's that is, you know, when you change strengths and then you change strengths again, and you, you move people into certain positions to get matchups and sometimes you know idea covers whatever like that is stressful probably underused as you know so many teams and I think we're, we're kind of coming into maybe a new new era of football where you're seeing a lot come back right we already know the tight end has has made a comeback there was a time when everybody was 10 right and you know motion kind of went out other than maybe a very simple motion, one yeah. guy across shifting went out you know, to, to change strength, to move people to different position, to disguise a formation. But but those are things that make it complex that if, again, going to your structure, you structure it right, use terminology the right way, can be very simple for you to do. Yeah, I mean, just think about it. If, if there's a team, and there's rhymes and reasons to do everything. You know, one of the things that I used to be terrified of when I first became a coordinator way back in... 11 and 12 was like people are going to blitz you all the time you're like ah geez you know the picture is changing or whatever but if you take these teams that want to pressure you a whole bunch like take a three a three progression movement by an offense so like let's say you wanted to snap the ball from pro right just regular old-fashioned pro right everyone's got it you can trade the tight end to pro right so i can line up four plays in a row i can say all right first down pro right run a play second down trade the tight end run the play third down motion somebody whether that's a z maybe the fullback whatever motion somebody to pro right and run the play and then if you have and then if you build in something like a like call it a shift or a movement or an atlas whatever and say move to pro right where it's trade followed by that same motion now if there's people that are checking their their pressures to certain strengths or certain people you can immediately get those guys to second guess those because if you the atlas piece or the movement piece is okay a trick they line up originally 11 decisions are made defensively run yes. fits gaps everything yes somebody moves now you're at 22 decisions made eyes in the wrong spots now another piece motions you're talking 33 decisions right. by kids that's hard you ever coached it's hard to get them to make 11 right decisions yeah, every play exactly so now you're talking 33 decisions and eyeballs all over the place and I think those things are ways that you can help manipulate what they're going to be able to call or what they're doing and you know the keys and all that to to be able to stay a little bit more basic or to execute better yeah I mean that's exactly it like my my thought behind it and philosophy with using all the movement was I'm creating more opportunities for them to be wrong to make oh absolutely like to when I move, they need to recognize, communicate, and adjust. And I, I forget who I had on the podcast. I said, you know, that's that's three chances to be wrong. Said, no, that's 33 chances to be yeah. wrong. Yeah, I mean, you watch your tape. I mean, it, some of the stuff you hit, I mean, like, they're, the coverages are so busted or the fits are so wrong. They're so they, – they were so – They'd be hard to even start to correct on the sideline Mm -hmm. because the kids don't know who screwed up. So they can't go over there and give quality data to the defensive coaches who then can talk to each other and try to get it figured out before the next series starts because there were so many moving pieces. So there's Ansel. I mean, like, you watch your tape. That was very evident. Like, man, if you got them on it once, you're probably going to be able to get them on it more than once. So, yeah, just that the little things like that are so, so beneficial. Thank you again for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. Please, if you are enjoying the podcast, head over to iTunes or Spotify and click five star for a rate. If you have a minute, write a review. It really helps the podcast. Check out our new home for the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. That's at coachandcoordinator.com. And follow me on Twitter at Coach K. Grabowski.